Hey everyone, welcome back to another very exciting episode here at the Photoshop Training Hour. I am your host, Jesus Ramirez. It's so great to see all of you today in the chat. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm watching from the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. It's great to be back here with you all. As you probably already know, I had a little bit of a medical emergency, so I was away for about a month, but I'm back feeling strong, feeling healthier, better and better each day. I appreciate all the comments from everyone who left a comment in my previous video on how to colorize a video using Photoshop. I talked a little bit about that there, and I appreciate all the well wishes. But Thank you so much for watching. Um, this episode of the Photoshop Training Hour is sponsored by our good friends at MSI. You can see the logo on this side, actually. You can see the logo there and on my shirt. So thank you so much, MSI, for sponsoring today's Photoshop Training Hour episode. This is going to be a 100 Photoshop tips and tricks episode. I'm, I hope that I can get through all of them. I might stay a little bit past the hour if I can get through all of them in time. I want to show them all to you, but I have a list here with me so that I don't forget and I get to show you 100 Photoshop tips and tricks that I hope that you don't know so that you learn something. And if you know them, that's okay. I do have one favor to ask. If you see a tip or trick or technique that you think will benefit you in your workflow, make sure that you hit that like button and let me know what that tip or technique it is in the comments. Also, let me know how my voice is. Before we get started, I want to make sure that we have good audio. So let me know in the chat. And I just quickly want to say... Um, hello to everyone. There's so many comments in the chat that I really can't get to all of them, but thank you so much. We have people watching from Estonia, Belgium, Maryland, Brazil, Palm Springs, California. I used to live in um, Palm, uh, oh my God, a thousand palms for a little bit when I was a child. So not too far from Palm Springs, California. There's so many comments coming through that I can't read them all, but I do appreciate everyone being here with me today. So I have a lot to show you, and I also want to talk a little bit about MSI a little later on, but why don't we just jump right into today's session and get started with the Photoshop tips and tricks. Again, if there's something in here that I show you that you don't know, that you'll enjoy, and that you'll use in your work, make sure to hit that like button and let me know in the comments which one it was. Great. So, and also thank you for letting me know that the audio is okay. And yes, the stream will be saved on my YouTube channel, so you can come back and reference it later if you need to. So let me switch over into my screen. Here I am. And the first thing, uh, the first trick that I want to show you is that you know that you can select colors from anywhere in Photoshop. Obviously, inside of Photoshop, if you uh, have a photo selected, you can press I on the keyboard to enable the eyedropper tool, and you can click and drag to select the color, right? Well, that you know that you can also select the color from outside of Photoshop. So this could be your desktop or a web browser or anything that you want. All you need to do is click inside of the Photoshop application frame and then go outside of it. Notice that I'm now selecting the yellow and now the blue and the green from my desktop. See that? See, So I'm selecting the colors outside of Photoshop. Again, you can do that with any other application uh, as long as you drag from inside of Photoshop first and then drag out. Also, second tip, make sure that you have sample all layers selected. Sometimes you just might have current layer in below. So I have all layers selected. So that's here in the options bar. And if you don't want the, the ring, you can see the ring here. If you want to disable that, you can just click on this icon and then the ring will no longer show. I like the ring, so I like to have that enabled. So that's three tips there for you. Cool. So um, let me move on into the next tip. Like I said, I have a list here that I'm going to be referencing um, because as you might imagine, my memory is not all there. Um, in case you were wondering what my medical emergency was, I had a stroke about a month ago. Thankfully, my body's recovering well. Both of my um, sides are working about the same, so it's all good. But my memory is a little, a little off. <laughs> um, so the next thing I have for you is zoom into active pixels. So sometimes when you're working in Photoshop, you may have a, a bunch of different layers, and you might not necessarily know what a layer contains. And sometimes a layer might contain something so small that you don't even see that. Like right now, this layer contains that tiny little dot. So if you don't know um, what a layer contains, just hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click on the layer thumbnail. And Photoshop will zoom in to that specific area. Notice that in this case, it's zoomed in just because I have that tiny little dot. But if I do that on the actual background layer, it'll show me the entire image. So Photoshop will zoom in and show you all the pixels that are active in that layer. In this case, it was the entire layer, so it zoomed all the way out. In this case here, 
it zooms in just to the tiny little portion. By the way, this is a new feature. It, I believe it came out in Photoshop 2020, if I'm not mistaken. So if you're in an older version, this particular technique will not work. The one I showed previously should work on older versions of Photoshop. So yeah, it's a super, super cool technique for you to figure out if there's something there. Another thing that you might want to do in case that you have a bunch of layers and you don't know what they're in there, you might want to just delete all the layers that don't have anything there. How do you do that? Very simple. If you go into filter, scripts, you'll see that you'll have the delete all empty layers option. When you click on that, Photoshop automatically removes all the layers that are completely empty. Notice that it left layer number three where we had that tiny little dot. Even though it's just a few pixels, Photoshop left it because there is content in that layer. So this is something you may want to do on those big, large Photoshop documents that have a bunch of layers. Just make sure that you don't have anything extra that you don't need. Cool. <clears throat> Let's see, um, somebody was saying Photoshop uh, needs uh, to identify an empty layer. So I guess this is a way of identifying them. It deletes them, it doesn't really identify them. But yeah, I agree, it'd be kind of cool if maybe Photoshop would put like a red label on them or something. But yeah, that would be a cool feature. The next thing is the precise flare center. So a lot of you probably know that you can go into filter, render, lens flare. And from here, you can click and drag over the image, right, to, to place your flare anywhere that you like, and you can select all these different options. But that you know that you can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click on this preview window, and this precise flare center will bring up the coordinates for the X and Y um, coordinates for your image. How do you find out what the X and Y coordinates are on an image? Very easy. When you're working on a photo, you can just go into the info panel. And from the info panel, notice that as I move my cursor around the image, the X and Y coordinates right here move accordingly. So you can just remember what the X and Y coordinate is for something. So 2080 by 414, we'll say. <clears throat> so we can go into um, window. Oh, sorry about that. We can go into filter, render, lens flare. And you're gonna have to remember, help me remember here, was, what was that? Like 20, 40 by 414 or whatever it was. The point is, is that you can put in whatever values in there that you want and Photoshop will move the flare to that location automatically. And you can press okay and that will appear on there. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, you can do the same thing, right? Now that I've applied the filter on there, I can now fill the layer with black, this, this other layer here, this one, and then just repeat that same filter it appears in the same spot and change it to screen. You can do that if you want, um, totally up to you. Another thing that people do is do basically the same thing and then just move the layer around accordingly. And that can also work. But the downside of that is that I feel that the flare doesn't have the appropriate angle for the scene. So if you're gonna do um, either of these techniques, make sure that you have the appropriate angle for the scene. And I forgot to turn off my phone. So let me disable that, I apologize. Let me change that to um, do not disturb. But anyway, so that's something that you can do, precise flare center. Yeah, so let me know in the chat if this is something that um, you knew about. One of the questions says, can you copy that? I'm assuming you're referring to the coordinates. Unfortunately, you cannot copy the coordinates. I think it would be great if you can copy the coordinates. In fact, I think it would be even better if the render filter on, on the lens flare, just had the coordinates here on the side. I don't understand why you have to know this, you know, secret handshake just to get you in there. But it would be so cool that you could just have the the flare center here and you can just copy and paste or maybe even set a pin or something so that the um, coordinates were already pre-filled. But I agree with you. Unfortunately, you're gonna have to remember it. Cool. Um, let me move on to the next one. <laughs> Somebody wrote, was that a Tinder match? That was not a Tinder match. That was just the email notification, actually. Um, that's the notifications, I believe, that come standard with um, uh, Gmail, if I'm not mistaken, on Android. I have the new, by the way, I just have, a, I just got a new phone. So I have the uh, brand new Google Pixel 6 Pro. Just got it in. I don't even have a case for it yet. Um, but yeah. So next, let's talk about the Spot Healing Brush Tool and some uh, modes. So I know that I have a photo of a gentleman here and he will make a great example.
for this next technique that I want to show you. So and if I can't find them, there he is. So I have this guy and you know his face looks okay. There's a few blemishes here and there that we can try to remove. And one of the best things about this, uh, about the spot healing brush tool is that you can use it to remove blemishes and things like that. But when you start removing blemishes, sometimes you'll get these smudgy areas. See how I destroyed the texture? You want to try to avoid that when you're retouching. So obviously you want to work non-destructively so you can create a new layer. And from the spot healing brush tool, make sure that you have content aware enabled and that you're sampling all layers. But the technique that I want to show you is this here under mode, make sure that you select the appropriate mode for what you're trying to do. In most cases, you're going to select either darken or lighten. So what are you trying to do? Are you trying to darken the skin or lighten it? Well, it all depends on the blemish or the distraction. If the distraction is darker than the skin tone, you want to lighten it. If the distraction is brighter than the skin tone, then you want to darken it. In this case, I want to lighten some of these distractions. So when I paint, notice that I don't necessarily destroy the texture. I'm not really removing anything because there's no blemish, but I want, to, I want you to see that I'm not really destroying the texture. So when I come in here, I can remove all these little um, blemishes and hair, but I'm not really damaging. In this case, I did because this is an extreme uh, uh, adjustment. Obviously, I'm removing one of the um, smile lines, so I don't really want to do that. But for these smaller ones, it works great, as you can see, before and after. See that? See how great that is? It's not going to remove this bright one because that's light. If I wanted to remove that little white dot, I need to go into darken and then darken that up a little bit and there you go see that before and after so i recommend that you look at the skin and look at the distraction and determine if you need to darken it or brighten it and then select the appropriate mode here in the options bar cool let's go over into the next tip uh vanishing point okay so actually i just did a um, I guess I'm going to plug something. So I just did a, a TikTok video and a YouTube short. So I'm doing YouTube shorts and TikTok videos. Um, if you're into that on basically uh, this technique, but um, what you can do, actually, you know what? I'll do a different one than the one I had in mind just because I already did a video on it and I'll do something I haven't shown. That way you get to see something brand new that I haven't shown on any on my social media so it's gonna take me a little longer to find the file just because i want i just thought about it now and why not do something completely completely new so what i want to show you is how to place um a logo using vanishing point so i have um this bag here with this logo what if i wanted to put this logo on the front inside of the bag and keep it in perspective well you can use a filter called vanishing point so um what you can do first is make a selection out of the logo. So I'm using the space bar to move the selection as I create it. That's another tip there for you. It's gonna be more than 100 tips. I feel like I give tips inside of tips. Um, but anyway, so I'm gonna make a selection around the logo like so, and I'm just going to copy it or you can cut it. It doesn't really matter. Make sure you're in the right layer though. I was in the wrong layer. So you can cut it or you can copy it. Totally up to you, it doesn't matter. As long as you have it in your clipboard, then you can make uh, deselect, control D on Windows, command D on the Mac to deselect, create a new layer. And on this new layer, we can go into filter and we'll select vanishing point. From here, you can create a grid around the front face of the bag. Try to match the perspective as best as you can. You don't have to be perfect, but get it close enough. Once you have it, you can press control on Windows, command on the Mac and click and drag on the other side to extend the other face and then adjust the points here so that they match the perspective of the bag as best as you can. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but get it close enough and that, that will work. What I can do now is press Control V on Windows, Command V on the Mac to paste, and there's my logo, see that? And I can put that in there, Control T, Command T to transform it, and I can transform it just like I would transform any other thing in Photoshop. So now I have my logo there in front of the bag, and I can paste another one in there and make it even smaller and place this one here on the side of the bag. Maybe we'll go lower and much, much smaller on this side, but see that? Super, super cool. And then I can just press OK or tap on the Enter key or Return key. And you can see that before and the after there. And all I need to do now is change the blending mode to Multiply. 
and then maybe even reduce the opacity a tiny bit. And you can, of course, add a displacement map or anything else like that. You know what? I said displacement map, so why don't we? Why don't I show you what a displacement map is? Um, I was that's another tip I wasn't thinking about showing you guys. So a displacement map is basically a Photoshop file that will help you um, bend objects around the surface of another Photoshop file. So all you need to do is go into File, Save As, and save this as um, a displacement map. I'll just call it displacement. There we go. So this is now a displacement map. And on this image, on the one that will become the displacement map, make sure that you blur it, but keep the actual edges so that you get a better blend and it's a little smoother and not so jagged. So what you can do is go into filter, blur, surface blur, and just blur it. I might be a little too much, so maybe a little less. I just don't wanna have a lot of the fine detail, but I do want the larger detail. So you can adjust it accordingly. Actually, we were pretty close at 18 or so, so something like that, and press OK. I'll close it and save it. Then I need to open up my Vanishing Point logo thing again. Oh, I didn't save it. See, not very smart of me, but that's OK. I can go into the dis uh, displacement, and it should still be there. Yeah, there it is. So what I'll do now, just because I didn't save the original one, I'm just going to drag this layer and place it here, and that should work. So that's the same thing, right? Like. Same thing. Anyway, so with the logo layer, you can convert it into a smart object if you want to work non-destructively, but then you can go into filter, distort, displace, and you're gonna have to play around with these numbers. I'll start with 10. It might be too much, it might not be enough, but 10 is a good place to start. Press OK and select that displacement map and notice now how Photoshop is bending the logo accordingly. And if you wanted to make it even more realistic, you can double click to the side of the layer and under the underlying layer here, hold Alt on Windows, Option in the Mac and click to split these in half like so. And also on the other side, just to get some highlights in there, more or less like that. And this is the result before and after. So not very difficult as you can see. Obviously you can play around with it and get better results, but I have a hundred things to show you. So there's more stuff on the way. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Thank you so much. I see a lot of comments about my recovery. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Grant, I think is who just, and the comments are flying by so fast. I'm sorry if I, uh, said the wrong name. Um, uh, yeah, so there's a comment in the chat that says you don't need to press control T command T on the Mac if you see the transformation handles. So on transformation, sometimes the handles are on. You can see that here, see this? So if the transformation handles are on, you don't need to press Control T, Command T on the Mac. If they're off, you do. Um, but it just depends on where in Photoshop you are and if you can see the transformation handles or not. So if you can see the transformation handles, you don't need to press the keyboard shortcut. That's correct. Cool. Um, next, let's talk about seamless patterns. So let me close some of these files just because I have too much stuff here and I don't want Photoshop slowing down on us. So what I'm gonna do now is on this uh, document, I'm just gonna fill it with, um, you know, whatever color purple should work. And if I have these assets here, you might've seen my video on this already, but that's okay. So we have this little, little guy here and we have this guy and we have this guy, right? And if you want to make a seamless pattern on, uh, out of this, how do we do that? Well, in Photoshop, you can now go into View, Pattern Preview. Photoshop will then show you a preview of what this will look like as uh, when it's tiled. And now I can just adjust it accordingly and we get a live preview of the pattern. See that? Super, super cool. And of course, you can transform it, rotate it, and do whatever you want to create your seamless pattern. Really, really cool stuff. Um, so yeah, make sure that you check that out. And actually, talking about seamless, oh, I should mention this. If you wanna save this as a pattern, go into edit and select uh, define pattern, give it whatever name that you want. And now you can use this pattern anywhere in Photoshop that you can apply a pattern, like in a layer styles, or you can go under window and select pattern. And there it is. And I can just drag and drop it there. 
and there's my pattern. See that? There it is. And I can change the scale to 25% or whatever percentage I want. But anyway, so that's one way of creating a pattern. Another way of creating a seamless pattern, this is very specific, but I thought I would throw it on there, is to create seamless clouds with the filter render menu. So if you create a document um, that is uh, to the power of two, so two by two, four by four, 16 by 16, uh, 128 by 28, 256 by 256, or in this case, I'm going to create a pattern that, that is, um, let me just see how the size that I decided to make it for this tutorial, 1024 by 1024, you will get uh, seamless clouds. So 1024 by 1024, I can click on create and we have that, that square that's a perfect square to the power of two. If I go into filter, render, clouds, these clouds, and actually let me make it um, black and white so it's easier to see. Um, so these clouds should theoretically be seamless. Let's see if that's the case. If I go into view, pattern preview, we should get seamless clouds. And yeah, you can see that they're seamless. There is absolutely no seam on those clouds. So again, if you want to create a clouds pattern that is completely seamless, make sure that you create the document size to the power of two. Again, two by two, four by four, 16 by 16, uh, 60, what is it, 128 by 128, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, you can you can do that if you want. Also, if you want to create uh, clouds that have um, more contrast, you can go into filter, render clouds and hold alt on windows option in the Mac and click and that should create clouds with more contrast as you can see. So holding alt on windows option in the Mac as you go into that command just gives you clouds with more contrast. There you go. In case you're someone who likes to use the clouds pattern for your projects. Cool. Let's see. <clears throat> What is next? Oh, okay, so I have something for uh, composites. I don't really have a composite here, but that's okay. I think that you'll get the idea. So when you're, compo not just compositing, when you're doing any type of work, sometimes your eye can get a little tired just because you're just looking at, at an image over and over and over again, and you might not necessarily see any mistakes. So Photoshop added this feature maybe two, three versions ago called Flip Horizontal. And that just flips the image horizontally. That's a preview. So you're not actually distorting pixels. So it's just the way that Photoshop is displaying the image. Um, before, artists used to go into image, image rotation, and then flip canvas hor uh, horizontal to do the same thing. And the problem with doing that is that you're actually distorting pixels. So in larger documents with a bunch of layers, this process will be very slow and even to revert back, it could be slow. So Photoshop just added this feature called um, flip horizontal. And you're not, again, you're not changing the pixels. If I were to close this file, open it up again, it would be back to its normal location so or its normal orientation. So the view feature is only the way that Photoshop displays the image to you. It's not really changing pixels and this is valuable because you can see your image in a new eye. Uh, so things, things might pop up that you might have not seen before. So make sure that you use this flip horizontal feature to see things that you probably didn't see before when you're working on your images, not just composites. Cool. Let me see what's next. We, cool. So now we have um, one of my new features, uh, favorite new features. And I'm looking for a photo that I, I like using for this, but if I don't find it, that's okay. I, I saw another one that I could use. Yeah, this is not my favorite photo to use for this. Actually, you know what? Um, I think um, I might be able to find it in, if I do all libraries. And let me see if I can, oh, here we go, she, there she is. So this is the, the image that I like using for this and I'm gonna make it smaller just so it doesn't take so long as we're working here. And actually maybe even 25%. So if you're ever working with an image and you want to remove a color cast, you can actually use one of the new neural filters to remove that color cast. Let me show you how that works. You can go into filter, neural filters, and you might already know of that technique that I talked in just my last uh, video, which is colorize. You can take a black and white photo or video, by the way. If you don't know how to do that, look at my last video. I show you how to colorize an actual video in Photoshop. But anyway, 
you can click on colorize to colorize a black and white image. But if the image is colored already, you can still use it. And what that does, and that just neutralizes the image. See that? See how I remove that weird color cast and it just completely neutralized it, right? Now it's not perfect. If you notice, she's wearing a green shirt, but that's okay. We, we can easily fix that. So I can just press okay. And now I can disable this, zoom in, and make sure that I select that same color green, that one right there. I can create a new layer, set the layer to color, and I can just now colorize that shirt. Obviously, I'm going super quickly here. I'm not going to do that great of a job, but I think that you get the idea. See that? So now there she is. So this is um, before and after. Obviously not perfect since I didn't spend a lot of time fixing that. Another thing that I could do is look at other details like the background here. That was actually blue. So I can come in here and then paint uh, that in with blue here as well if need be. So, you know, you can take your time and just try to match it as close as you can to the original if you want. And if you're happy just with what Photoshop generated, then you can use that as well. Can we do it without the filter? Uh, the only way of doing it without the filter that I can think of off the top of my head is doing basically what I just did uh, here, just painting it, which will take forever and it probably won't look that good. So the filter does save you a lot of time. Let's see. Can you make, uh, I want to make a complete guide for beginners. So that might be coming soon. As you could imagine, I'm, I'm working a little slow right now but that is something that I definitely want to do. Cool. Um, so Stefan is asking when the PTC lives are. I was doing them more frequently in the past. Now they're a little less frequent. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, I want to do them once a week. So maybe next week I'll have another one, but you can see on the Photoshop training channel, YouTube channel, um, when my next stream will be. So far I don't have another one scheduled, but some of you saw this one scheduled from a few days ago. Um, cool. Um, somebody's talking about the curve trick. I'm going to show it later, but that's a little different. Um, the curve trick actually works better to neutralize the image. This one has just different color lights. So it's a little bit different, but we'll talk about that in a moment. I'm using Photoshop 2022, but a lot of the things I've shown work in older versions. Clearly the, um, neural filters are all for the newer version of Photoshop, but some of the things I've talked about already work on older versions. Cool. Let's see what's next. I'm so glad I have this list because I would have forgotten. <laughs> um, something I wanted to mention is that you can actually apply neural filters to video. So let me just open up um, a file here that I have and it's a video file and that video file will uh, open up on a neural filter. And again, a lot of people didn't know that neural filters work with video and you kind of have to trick Photoshop a little bit into into doing that. Um, give me one second here. I'm just trying to find that file that I thought I had right in the tip of my fingers, but I guess I do not. Here we go. Um, let me just open that up in Photoshop. Actually, you know what? Even better. I'll show you how to open it up from Photoshop. You can go into file open in Photoshop and then, you know, go to wherever that file is. And I have an MP4. That's a video file. So with that video file, all I need to do is just open it up in Photoshop and Photoshop will open it up just like any other image. And you can see that this is indeed a video. Super cool, right? So actually one of the things that you can do um, that I wasn't even going to talk about, but I'm going to mention it is, um, well, two things. I'm just getting all over the place here. So one thing at a time. First is I wanted to show you the Skype replacement feature, but before I go into that, I want to show you something else. But a caveat, if you go into edit, notice the uh, sky replacement is disabled. Photoshop can't apply the sky replacement on video. But if you convert it to a smart object, Photoshop will think it's an image. And then there you go, sky replacement. We're going to go back to that. But now that it's a smart object, I can go into filter, neural filters. And I don't know how this is going to work because I haven't tried it, but we can try the same thing. We can try to apply the colorize feature. And there you go. See it applied some water and the color of the sky. You can actually click on here and then maybe, you know, we'll make this super blue water. This is not really how that looks, but um, I don't know how many people in the chat live in London or near London, but we know that that water is not that blue, but let's just assume that it is. 
Uh, when you add a point, you can also hold Alt and Windows option in the Mac and drag to the other side, and then Photoshop will colorize that. I can click on the top here. That's way too blue. Maybe we'll leave this like, you know, like light blue, something like that. I don't know. The point is, is that now we've uh, colorized this video, and obviously it'll, it'll take a while for Photoshop to to render. Oh, I made a mistake. So my mistake was when you want to do this to a video file, what you need to do is on export, you need to make sure that you select um, output to a smart filter. So make sure that you do that if you're doing this to a video. The reason being is that when you do that to, when you set it to a smart filter, it will apply the filter to all the frames and not just the one. So now, if I were to move over here, you can see how the video is moving and it's you know colorized. See that? I mean, not not the best colorization in the world, but there you go. Anyway, so let me go back to the one thing I really wanted to show you is after you convert the video into a smart object, you can now go into Edit, Sky Replacement, and you can replace the sky in Photoshop. And I'll just press OK. You can use any sky that you want. And as you can see, there's a new sky. And the reason that that's not showing all the way through is that you need to extend the video file or the images so that they're as long as the video. See that? And obviously this is not the best sky replacement in the world. I didn't choose an appropriate image and I didn't adjust the settings, but you can do that on your own. I just wanted to show you that if you have a video file that was shot on a tripod, Photoshop will not motion capture. So you need to shoot on a tripod. You can trick Photoshop into thinking this is an image and you can apply a sky replacement. Super, super cool. See that? So again, if you didn't know, if you've seen something that you enjoyed so far, make sure that you hit that like button now and let me know which one it is. Cool. What do you do if neural filters are grayed out? Okay, so good question. It depends on which neural filter it is. But if you're trying to use this, the, this filter that I just tried to use the... Um, Colorize filter, and let me see if I can black and white. I think I have a black and white image here. Uh, I don't know if that one will work. Um, oh man, I don't think I have a, a, I mean, I guess I can fake it for you, but yeah, I guess I'll fake it for you. So so if you have an, an image, um, like we'll say this one, right? And you change the mode to grayscale. So a lot of black and white images will have grayscale and notice now that on the tab here, you have the word gray. If you try to apply um, some of these neural filters, it will not work. So notice that I have the colorize feature disabled. See that? I can't, I can't use it. And the reason being is that we need to be in an RGB mode. So the way to do that is simply by opening your image, going into image mode and selecting RGB. And once it's an RGB, you can see that here in the tab. Then this will work. So filter, um, neural filters, and we have now the colorized feature enabled and we can click on that and see what Photoshop does. And it does an okay job. It, it didn't do as good a, jo as a job as, as another, the other videos, but that's okay. You can, or the other examples, excuse me, but that's okay. You can come and fix that again by clicking on here and selecting a color for a sweater. Maybe we'll change it to green for whatever reason. I don't know, I think green might look good. And then you can just, hold Alt on Windows option in the Mac and then apply the green all over his his uh, body there until we have a green sweater. But anyway, you get the idea. Cool. Let me see what we have next. And to be honest, I don't even remember at what time we started. Oh yeah, I, I remember now. I was gonna say, I don't even know how much time we have. We have about half an hour, <laughs> um, but I'll stay a, I'll stay a little longer to mention more uh, tips and tricks. Cool, so the next thing I wanted to show you is just a new feature in Photoshop that you might not be aware of. And it's one of my favorites actually, one of my favorite new features, which is the um, object Finder. So with the object selection tool, you have this option now. You can see that the little checkbox. Make sure that object finder is enabled. And when it's enabled, you can just hover over an, uh, over an image and it will highlight the main subject. See that? I'm highlighting these cute little dogs. If you click on it, Photoshop will make a selection. I can hold shift and click on another dog and Photoshop will select that second dog. And if I want to deselect, I can hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click 
and I just have this dog selected and I can do anything I want, right? I could create a layer mask, I could add an adjustment, you know, anything, whatever you want, but there it is. So this is a new feature that I really, really enjoy. And if you haven't used it, I recommend that you check it out. Cool. Um, so there's a question about one of the neural filters. I'm not going to spend too much time on it just because I wasn't planning on it. But the question regards the um, style transfer neural filter. So let me just open it up. And I should have done it with a um, <laughs> with a with a different um, filter. Actually, you know what? Maybe I can. Uh, I guess we'll go with this one. So I can enable the style transfer, and then Photoshop has these files that I could download or I can use to apply the style of my image onto the current image that I'm working with. I can select custom and I can upload my own image from my computer um, or just use one of the presets, totally up to you. And then you have these sliders to control that style of your image. That's basically how that works. Cool. Um, let me see what I have next. Okay, so I guess, it. you know what? I haven't tried this next technique with this image, but we'll see how that works. So some, so you can use um, a filter to create motion. And usually when, when I use this filter, I like to just duplicate the layer, Control J on Windows, Command J on the Mac. And on this background layer, what I'll do is I'll just make a selection out of like my main subjects. So here I am selecting all of them by holding Shift and clicking on them with the um, object selection tool with object finder enabled. I'm going to expand my selection just a little bit. And I think that should be good. It, may, it might not be perfect, but that's okay. And then I can go into edit, um, content aware fill, and it should remove the people from the image, which is exactly what I want. Press okay. And there we go. So now I have the people in a new layer and in one layer without people, which is great. So what I'm going to do now is just create a layer mask on this layer. So now I have the people and the dog, of course, and then the background. And then this looks a little, a little messy. So what I can do is just make a quick selection here. And there's so many ways I can get rid of this. Something that I just haven't talked about today that will work just as fine as any other method is using the patch tool. And I can just click and drag this to another side and there you go. So whatever method you want, this patch tool is super cool because you can just make a, a selection around an area, like for example, the shadows here, right? And then just drag it to a new location and Photoshop will copy the texture onto that. But I wanna keep the shadows, but anyway. So now what I can do is, you know, work non-destructively, so I'll convert it into a smart object by right-clicking on that. Then I can go into filter and I can select blur gallery path blur and I have this blur here and I can just select you know the 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 way that my blur is going so I don't know maybe blur going this way I guess I don't know whatever 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 seems best to for you and your image so I think in this case maybe my I want my blur to go this way like so and I can maybe create one going that way and then one going this way like so and obviously spend more time fine tuning uh, the details of your of your image. See that going faster? And I'll press okay. This is obviously extremely exaggerated and stylized, but the point is, is that I'm creating motion by using these paths and then I can just add my people in there and now it looks like they're running super, super fast. See that before and after. And the reason that I took them away from the background, that I removed the main subjects from the background, was so that the blur wouldn't create any ghosting. So for example, if I, let me show you what would happen if I would have just kept uh, this layer here. I'm going to filter. Actually, what I'll do just to show you, uh, convert it into a smart object. And you can duplicate a smart object by holding Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, clicking and dragging it to another layer. So there you go, another tip that I wasn't planning on showing you. That's just gonna duplicate that filter. And see how we have ghosting now? See that ghosting effect? So that's why I removed the people from the background that I blurred so that I wouldn't have that ghosting. See that? You might want the ghosting for something, so that's totally cool. In this case, I didn't want the ghosting. Cool. Uh, Ari's asking, will this video be available online later? Yes, it will. It will be online forever and ever and ever. 
it's time to talk about MSI. So let me bring that up. So MSI is the sponsor for today's session. You can see their logo here on my shirt and on uh, here on my top right or left. I'm not sure where above my head it is. And um, I'm currently using, uh, for a laptop, I'm using the MSI Creator Z16. It's a professional laptop. The link is in the description. Um, it's a really fantastic laptop. It has a dedicated video card and it's great for creators. So make sure that you check it out. Also, I just wanted to mention one thing about MSI. A lot of you may not be familiar with MSI. It's a brand that might not be recognized by a lot of you, but uh, Reader's Choice 2021 on PC Mac uh, Magazine rated MSI uh, on top of overall satisfaction right up there with Apple, as you can see, and you can scroll on this page if you wanna check it out. Um, but basically, it just puts MSI right up there with some of the best brands. And even uh, on some marketing material with Apple, you'll notice that they compare their high-end PCs with um, MSI computers. So MSI is definitely a big player in the game. If you're a PC user and you are looking for a new laptop, then I highly recommend the MSI Creator Z16. Like I said, it's the laptop that I'm currently using. As you can see, this is it is right here. This is it, MSI Creator Z16. Uh, obviously, I'm not using it for the stream, but it's the laptop that I that I use as my desktop. I have an MSI Aegis Ti five which is a, a powerful machine this is the one that i'm currently using to stream and to do everything that you're watching me do so make sure that you check it out link is also in the description and the monitor what i'm reading your comments the monitor here on my right is the msi creator ps32 one urv it's a mouthful but it is a fantastic fantastic monitor so make sure that you check out all these products um, there might be some sales going on because of the thanksgiving holiday but again, if you are new to MSI, just know that it is a reputable brand. And as you can see from PC Mag's uh, reviews for 2021, they're, they're right up there with brands such as Apple and above pretty much all other Windows brands. So make sure that you check it out. Awesome. Let's try to get back to where we were. There we are. What I was trying to show you is if you press Control A on Windows, Command A on the Mac, it will make a selection around the canvas. When you have the Move Tool active, you can click on these icons here on the center ones to center your object that you selected uh, horizontally and vertically to the selection. And since the selection is around the canvas, it's gonna center it to the canvas. Cool. What I wanted to show you though, is that you can load a layer as a selection by holding Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and clicking to load that as a selection. Then I can come here and make a black, uh, fill with black, Alt and Backspace to fill with the foreground color. That's Option, Delete on the Mac. And as you can see, now I have just basically the same thing in black. And what I can do now is go into Filter, Blur Gallery, and select Path Blur. And I can now create a long shadow effect just by increasing my speed, see that? And I can just center the blur like so. And look at that, super, super cool. And obviously that might be a little too much, but you get the idea, maybe something like that. See that? It's interactive and very cool. So you can just create a cool long shadow effect that way. And obviously after you create it, you can change the you know, blending mode to maybe multiply and adjust the opacity and, and stuff like that. But this creates a really cool long shadow effect and it, it looks much more realistic than almost any other technique. Cool. Um, so there's a question about style transfer. Um, so I'll answer it. Um, the person is asking if they could be used for color and lighting matching. I wouldn't use it for that. There's another feature um, that I'll talk about in a moment that should be better for that. And it's the new, what do they call it? Um, oh God, um, I guess I'm gonna have to double click in, in, on an image and see what they call it. But you can use the filter neural filters, you could use the said harmonization. You can use the style, tra no, not st harmonization. Yeah, you can use the harmonization filter for that. So if you want to color match and all that, use the harmonization filter. That's the one that will be better for that rather than the style transfer. Cool. So let's see what I have on my list now. We are 
Give me one second while I open up the next file. So there's so much to cover that I can't believe I said I would do a hundred things. I feel like <laughs> we're, we're barely like 20 things in, but with the bonus things I've shown you, that's probably like 50 things in. Um, let's see. So the next thing that we are going to look at is um, some of my favorite algorithms uh, for Photoshop. Oops, that's not the right truck. I do want to open a truck, but that's not the right one. Okay, we don't need a truck. We can use this image. So one of the things that I like um, changing as soon as I open up Photoshop is the default algorithm. So with the curves adjustment layer, there's this auto button here. If you hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click, Photoshop um, will show you the algorithms that it's using. By default, Photoshop uses enhanced brightness and contrast. So whenever you create a curves adjustment layer and click on auto, Photoshop will apply, um, oops, sorry about that. I didn't change the algorithm. Uh, enhanced brightness and contrast, save as default. So when you create a curves adjustment layer, Photoshop uses that algorithm automatically by default. And that's not my favorite one. In my opinion, there's a better one. You saw it already. If you hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac and click, you'll see the find dark and light colors algorithm. And to me, that's the better one. I like checking snap neutral midtones and I like to save that as default so that when I click on auto, Photoshop uses that algorithm. So let me show you how that works. Curves, auto, and there you go. Much, much better. It doesn't always work though. If you ever have an image where you use that algorithm and it doesn't quite work, that's okay. Click on this icon on the gray point eyedropper and click somewhere in the image that should be a neutral gray and it should fix the image for you. You're probably wondering, well, why do all that work? It, can't I just create a curves adjustment layer and click on the gray point eyedropper and then click on a neutral gray, you can. The color, the image is much better obviously, but there's no contrast. So you, you would still need to adjust the contrast in the image. So I think it's better to just click on auto, see what happens. And if need be, then click on a gray point in the image and you can neutralize it much, much faster. Cool. Let me see what I have here on my list next. Cool, cool, cool. Awesome. So I'm going to skip one because I already talked a little bit about that. Um, so, so with the curves adjustment layer, there's a few ch keyboard shortcuts that I wanted to show you. So you probably know that you can click on, a, on one of these points and you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard to fine tune those points. See that? Up, down, left right or you can hold shift and then click and they go much faster see that left right but that you know that you could also pr uh, press the plus icon and it goes up see that how now i'm now i'm now selecting the, the the top one and i can control it i can press the minus key and go down see that so you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard to control the positioning of the point that you have selected and you can control what point is selected by pressing on the plus or minus keys it just goes up and down the list cool Let's see. Ah, this is this is what somebody was talking about, but I need to find the right image for that. So give me one moment while I find this image. So I want to find a, a really good image for this. So it might take me a second here, um, just because now I'm gonna talk. I was gonna talk about just the curves adjustment layer, but now since somebody brought up the filter, I want to talk about the filter as well, and. Basically, there are filters in Photoshop that allow you to um, harmonize images and there's an old, old way of doing it and a new way of doing it. So I wanna show you both. You know what, I'm, I think I'm wasting too much time here. So I know that I have images here on my libraries panel that can help us with that. So there's this image here and there's this mountain image here. 
so we have these two images, right? And I'll put it here. And maybe I'll transform the image because the guy's looking the, the wrong way, but whatever. And I'm going to remove the background. There it is. So we have this guy, you know, burning his eyes because he's looking right into the sun. But can we color match this guy to the background? Well, there's one way of doing it with curves. With curves, you can go into the curves adjustment layer, clip it to the layer below, hold Alt on Windows, Option on the Mac, and click on Auto. And instead of snapping neutral midtones, you do find the dark and light colors. And for the shadows, just select the darkest color in the image. Notice how it didn't work. That's because I have the layer mask selected. I needed to select the curves adjustment layer. If you forgot to click on it like I did, no biggie. Hold Control on Windows, Command on the Mac, and click, and then that'll look at the layer, not the layer mask. So, you know, you can just select whatever color you think the shadows would be, and you can adjust it if need be. And do the same thing for the highlights, like so. You know, just find something that's not a specular highlight. And again, you can adjust it accordingly and move it any way that you want. If you think you can do it better manually, press OK. And press OK one more time. Photoshop will ask you if you want to save these as a target colors. Usually you don't want to do that, so press no. And you can just do some adjustments with the contrast here. And you can see the before and the after. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is with the neural filters. The neural filter, you can go into filter, neural filters, and you can go into the harmonization, enable it, and let me move this over to the side so that you can see what's going on, and select the layer. I'm going to select a uh, layer to reference. So I'm going to select the background, and Photoshop will process the image and it will try to color match it. And you can adjust the strength if you want, and you can adjust all the other settings. In this case, I don't think Photoshop is doing that good of a job. So probably not the best image to show this, this example, but there you go. So you can maybe fine tune it. So in this case, maybe I'll add more yellow. And I think I like the saturation where it was. But the point is, is that you can use this adjustment layer to control the uh, harmonization. So I don't really like the blue that Photoshop is giving here. Maybe I can add a little bit of red here to try to off balance that. And I, that seems to be working a little bit. But the point is, is that you can make all these adjustments to try to harmonize the image. And when you're done, you can just press OK. And that's the result. So I like doing it the manual way better, but you can use the filter if you want to as well. Sometimes a filter gives you great results. So it's just a matter of trial and error. Hmm. So the question is, is there a way of, so, I mean, that's a very general question, so I'm not exactly sure how to answer it, but someone is asking about adding very specific hues. I mean, so I know what you're trying to say, but I'm going to answer the question, how you said it, just so hopefully that helps me, helps people understand the problem. So if I wanted to make something a specific color, right? So let, let's just work with this image. And if I wanted to make, say, his shirt a specific color and say, well, I want this red, right? This hue, you know, uh, with zero degrees, right? When I paint on it, you know, well, why isn't it, why isn't this looking realistic, right? Why doesn't it look like the red I want to? Well, I can change it to color, right? But then when you're, when it's set to color, it doesn't really look real either. So why is that? Well, colors have three components, right? We have hue, which we match. We match hue 100%. Um, saturation and brightness. The problem in this case is the brightness. So a lot of times when you're trying to color match, a lot of people are so focused on, on one thing, which is the, the color, the hue, and you're not really thinking about the brightness and all these other things, how they would look in the real world. So a lot of times uh, on top of adding hue or trying to match the hue, you also need to match the um, color of the image and actually I need to go like right here. Um, and notice that when, once I start, you know, darkening and brightening, you know, the shirt in different ways, it starts to look a little more realistic. Um, so yes, hue is very important to match, but you also have to think of the highlights and shadows and how those would look in the real world as well, which is why thinking about how can I match the hue, it's not really thinking about the entire problem because a color will look different under different lighting conditions. So if I just want to steal that red from a different image and place it here, it may or may not work depending on the lighting conditions and the colors and the ambient of the image 
So I hope that that sort of explains the 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 answer to the question: How do I match you? Well, matching you is very easy, right? I just I just matched it. But in most most of the times, most of the times that's not enough. You have to think about the lighting conditions, which is why you need other adjustment layers. And you know, in some cases, even a hue and saturation adjustment layer. Now copy the layer mask, Alt on Windows option in the Mac and drag a layer mask to copy it. Um, because again, it all depends on the on the lighting conditions so that the the saturation might be too strong or, or not enough depending on, on the lighting conditions. So I hope I hope that makes sense. Okay, we can use um, this document for this. Um, that you guys know that in Photoshop, and I'll close some of these other ones just so that we don't have too much stuff here, but that you know that in Photoshop, we can open up the same document in two windows so that we can work on detail and on the overall image at the same time. So if you go to um, window, arrange, at the bottom, you'll see a list of all your open documents. In this case, I have one open document, so I only see one, but I can create a new window for that document. So now I have the same document in two windows. This is not a different file. This is exactly the same file. And then I can go into window, arrange, workspace, um, I'm sorry, window, arrange, and then select either two up horizontal or two up vertical. I'll do two up vertical in this case. And now I have the same document in two windows. So what I can do now is, you know, zoom in really, really close here on his shirt, for example. And then over here, I can just see the entire image. I'll zoom in more, maybe like that. So then I can come in and I can start working on this, on these, little small details, but notice that when I work on the small details on the left, when I'm zoom, zoomed in, I can see the changes applied on the right hand side. So I can see how the entire image looks when I'm making tiny little details. And that just avoids you from having to zoom in and out. So, you know, usually what you do is you zoom in, you make up an adjustment. You're like, oh man, how does that look with the entire image? I'll zoom out and see, okay, well that looks good. I'll zoom back in and you can see the problem, right? You don't you don't have to keep zooming in and out anymore. Uh, another keyboard shortcut is if you hold alt on, uh, I'm sorry, if you hold the, the space bar, you can obviously, you know, pan, right? But if you hold shift in the space bar, you'll pan both at the same time. See that, see how both are moving? So space bar shift and click and drag will move them both at the same time. Now I have the, uh, zoom tool enabled, if I hold shift and click, it zooms in on both at the same time. And if I hold shift, alt and click, it zooms out on both at the same time. So there you go. I even I already lost track on how many tips and tricks I've shown, but I'm sure it's more than the number I see on here because I keep thinking of new things to show you as we go along. Um, cool. Let's see. I thought I had disabled my phone. I am sorry. I don't know what happened. Um, let me now talk about a couple free things that you can get in Photoshop. So in Photoshop, when you have the brush tool enabled, you can go into this gear icon and select get more brushes. And it will bring up this window. This window here are brushes from Kyle T. Webster. They're professional brushes from Adobe, a thousand brushes, and they're, they're updated so often. So they have a fall 2021 brush set. I haven't even downloaded this brush set. So let's take a look at it together, but they have a whole bunch. The one I recommend before we look at that one is the concept one. They have some really good brushes for compositing, but there's all kinds of brushes. So select the ones that you enjoy the best, but click on download. It'll just download an ABR file. And all you need to do is just click on it and Photoshop will install it and it's installed. So I can just go in my brushes here and all the way at the bottom, all the way at the bottom, you should see the fall 21 brushes. There they are. So I don't even know what these are, but the point is, is that we have these, these cool brushes that you can download for free. So let's see what this one looks like. Actually, where's my Wacom tablet? My Wacom tablet's over here, but you know, you can see, let me just, um, let me bring my Wacom. I wasn't planning on using it, but have a medium Intuos Pro Wacom tablet. Um, for those of you that are wondering, I actually also have, and somebody's gonna let me know in the chat because I forget the name, but the Wacom tablets with the actual screen on it, um, whatever they're called, um, I have it and I've only used it once. I actually prefer this one, but those are also really cool. But anyway, this is one of the brushes that um, came in that I just downloaded. So as you can see, 
they're pretty, pretty cool. So make sure that you check them out. Um, talking about brushes, actually, you know what? Before we move on, let me show you another free thing and then we'll come back to brushes. So another free thing in Photoshop is um, skies. So if you have an image like the one we were just looking at, and I'll make it smaller so it doesn't take so long. So I'll make that smaller, 50% should be good. And I can go into image, sky replacement, uh, edit, sky replacement, edit, sky replacement. And under this, under this drop down, you can select the skies that you want for your image, right? Super, super cool. But what you can also do is click on get more skies and you can download free skies. There you go, see that? Free skies. And it'll bring you up to this window. And from this window, you can download more sky packs for free. So yeah, there you go. See sunsets, spectacular skies, night skies, blue skies, storms. They were created by these wonderful artists, including Russell Brown from Adobe. Um, by the way, my first in-person conference will be with Russell Brown next April in Monterey, California. Um, so yeah, Russell Brown is holding an event, which will, I will attend. Um, I don't have the link for it yet, but keep an eye out for it. Um, but anyway, so you can download those and then you can use them here. So you can, as you can see, I already downloaded them. So we have like these spectacular skies. So maybe I can add, you know, maybe this one to this image and see how that looks like, or maybe this one and see how that looks like. But free stuff that you can get directly from Adobe. Other free stuff that's in here that it's hidden and I'm not sure why is legacy patterns, brushes and presets um, and layer styles. So with the brush tool, there's a lot of really good brushes that are inside of Photoshop. They're just hidden for some reason. So when you have your, let me just show you the easy way. So you can click on this down pointing arrow and click on the gear icon and you can click on legacy brushes and press okay. And then when you go to the very, very bottom of the list, you'll see legacy brushes. There they are. See that all these brushes that are just hidden that you can just use. Look at this. Look, look how many brushes there are. And for what, for, for whatever reason, um, Adobe likes to hide those. I don't know why. Same thing with, uh, patterns. You can go into window patterns and then on the flyout menu, legacy patterns, and you can see them right here. See that? See how many patterns are from 2019? So many, and even more from before. You can do the same thing for styles. You can go into the layer style, the styles here, and you can see, uh, I've already installed them, but you can click on the flout menu and select legacy styles and more, and it'll place the older ones in there. Um, so yeah, so make sure that you do that with the uh, patterns, layer styles, brushes, and if I'm forgetting something else, then then you can still go to the flyout menu and click on legacy and it will install them for you. Let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Cool. <clears throat> cool, cool, cool. Um, let me see what I have next. Okay, so I have a few things here that I want to show you also regarding brushes. So let me close this. If you find a brush like right now that you might download some of these brushes from Kyle Webster and every or you know, whoever it doesn't have to be Kyle, if, as long as maybe brushes that you created, the point is, is that if you have a brush that you really, really like, so let's say you're working on fo uh, in Photoshop, and you're working with this brush, and you love it, and you think it's great. Um, what you can do is save it into your library. So you can just, you know, these full 2021 brushes, maybe I'm working with this wonky brush, whatever this is, and I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm gonna save this brush. You can save it um, as anywhere you want, but also on your libraries panel. So you can just click and drag it into your library. So then you can have a library with just your favorite brushes. So you can create a library called My Favorite Brushes and just load them up on there. And that way the library has your brush and is synced with everything else all the time. So it's something that I recommend that you do. Also, let me select a different brush so that I could show you something. So let me see with this brush, what I'll do is I'll flatten it like this. You can flatten your brush and rotate it with this icon here. What you can do now is, um, you know, paint, right? 
but if you press the arrow keys on the keyboard, it rotates it. See that? See how I'm rotating it? See that? In older versions of Photoshop, you would need to go into here and then rotate it from here. In the new versions of Photoshop, you can just use the keyboard shortcut to rotate. Also, something new in Photoshop is with the tilde key on North American keyboards, that's the top left hand side of the keyboard next to the letter, uh, number one underneath the escape button. You can, let me just create a new, uh, do it all over again so you can see. Just paint this. You can hold a tilde key, again, to the left of the number one to erase. See that? So I'm erasing with the same brush. And that is different than going into the eraser tool but because when I go into the eraser tool, I have a different brush, right? So I would have to match that same brush, size, rotation, all that stuff if I wanted to get the same brush to erase. But with the tilde key, that works. Now, if you're in an older version of Photoshop, there's a trick of doing the same thing. So the trick is by going into the mode menu and selecting clear, that does exactly the same thing. So if you're in an old, older version of Photoshop, that's what you need to do. Um, there's also a different blending mode called behind and the behind blending mode. Let me change it to red so you can see the behind blending mode only paints on transparent pixels, not opaque pixels. So it's not going to paint over pixels that you already painted on. So that is the difference with those blending modes. See that? So behind only paints on transparent pixels and clear deletes pixels, which is the same thing as holding the tilde key and you know painting uh and, and erasing pixels see that super super cool um i'm sorry i don't have a full course on my photoshop channel training channel for beginners but that's something i want to do this coming year So there's questions in the chat about the best way of color matching. I have color matching videos on my YouTube channel. If you go to my YouTube channel, just look under the compositing playlist and you'll see a bunch of color matching videos. Cool. Um, I know I've gone over time here, but let me let me see. I, I'm not even like halfway of everything I wanted to show. Maybe we can do a part two to this, but there's so much more I wanted to show you. So um, I've been going for about an hour now, if I'm not mistaken. So somebody in the chat will let me know if I've gone about an hour. Um, but yeah, I definitely gone over an hour. Um, so what do you guys think? Should we just do a part two? Just because there's so much more on this list that I didn't really have time to get through at all. Uh, maybe I'll do a couple things. I'll do one more. Um, what would be good to show you guys? That would be good. Okay, so I, I think I know what I can do now. Um, this one should be a good one. So just a feature that not a lot of people know it's there. Let me just open up a couple photos and, and you'll see. So we'll do one more and then we'll do a part two. So we have this, this cool looking Thor dude. We have this truck, right? So, oh my God, the file names are so long. But <laughs> if, um, if I wanted to make, um, let's just assume, let me just make this smaller. So if we wanted to, if I have an image, right, like this image here, and it's a specific size, and I have a different image with a completely different size and aspect ratio, but I want them both to be the same, what do I do? Well, there's a feature in Photoshop when you select the crop tool called front image. So when you have the uh, crop tool selected, you can see that there's um, a front image option. So what I'll do is I'll select front image on here, and then go to the next image, and then when I crop, See that? See how the crop is just that same aspect ratio? And when I let go, no matter how small or big I go, it doesn't matter. When I crop, Photoshop will stretch or make the image smaller or larger depending on, on what it is so that it matches the, the other image. You'll see that? So they're now both exactly the same size. In some cases, you'll stretch the image to make it larger. In some cases, you'll... Um, minimize it to make it smaller it, it all depends on on the image and the size obviously but yeah that is the other thing i wanted to show you guys so we went about an extra 30 minutes almost and i still didn't even show you half the stuff that i had so maybe what we'll do is next week we'll come back to to the list and continue going there's so much more stuff i want to show you again if you saw something on this stream that you enjoy make sure that you hit that like button now and let me know in the comments which tip or technique that was 
Um, let me switch my screen over to the to the main screen. I would like to thank uh, our sponsors, MSI, again, for sponsoring this video. You can see MSI right up here. I'm wearing the shirt. The laptop is here, so make sure that you check out the links in the description. As you saw for, uh, earlier, MSI compares to brands like Apple and others like that. Um, so if you're looking for a new computer, I highly recommend the MSI brand, especially the MSI Creator Series, which are meant for creators and they're designed to work better with Adobe applications like Photoshop, Premiere, and all the others. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me with me today. I look forward to seeing you again next week. And I guess we'll continue with the list because I didn't get to all the tips and tricks. I apologize for that. I probably need like a three hour stream for 100 tips. I think I was a little ambitious. But anyway, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll see you again very, very soon.